Welcome, welcome everyone. Um, my name is Alka Patel and I'm professor in UCI's Department of Art History and the PhD program in Visual Studies, specializing in the art and architecture of South Asia and the Islamic world. I'm deeply grateful to the UCI Humanities Center for supporting this new In Conversation series titled Ideas with Impact, bringing university faculty together with professionals from other fields. Its principal aim is to highlight the manifold ways in which humanistic research meets today's global challenges. The series current format of less formal conversation is meant to draw in specialists as well as those generally interested in the series topics. Initially, I and Dr. Amanda Swain, who is executive director of the UCI Humanities Center, had envisioned ideas with impact as a once quarterly series, but it quickly transformed into five events just within this first academic year of its existence, attesting to my UCI colleagues encompassing consciousness and the wide relevance of their work. Professor Jeffrey Wasserstrom and Dr. Louisa Lim are the perfect trailblazers for the series. Uh, if I can say Jeff, my friend is UCI Chancellor's Professor of History and also serves as historical writing mentor for the literary journalism program and has a courtesy appointment at UCI Law School. He is the author, co-author, editor, or co-editor of more than 10 books, the most recent being his sole authored Vigil, Hong Kong on the Brink, published in 2022, and as editor, The Oxford History of Modern China, to be published in 2022. Dr. Louisa Lim, was a correspondent for NPR and BBC based in China for a decade is an, and is now senior lecturer at the University of Melbourne. Dr. Lim is the author of The People's Republic of Amnesia, Tiananmen Revisited, shortlisted for the Orwell Prize, and a new book titled Indelible City, Dispossession and Defiance in Hong Kong, to be published in April, 2022. So welcome to our conversationalists as well as the whole audience. Uh, I'll also be handing off the uh, kind of post of the directing of ceremonies to Professor Emily Baum from the history department um, uh, as we get underway. So welcome everybody. It's great to be launching this uh, series and there's nobody I'd rather be um, in conversation with than uh, Louisa Lim. So it's thanks so much for joining us from Australia. Oh, it's such a delight. Thank you so much for inviting me. Um, it's such an important time to talk about Hong Kong. Um, so it's great to have this opportunity. I agree. So let's start with what's going on in Hong Kong now and how we, we think about what's, um, what stands out to you as the things that people should be paying attention to at a time when it can sometimes seem that the world is paying less attention to Hong Kong than it was just a couple of years ago. Yeah, you know, that in itself is such a simple question, but it's actually so hard to answer because so much happens in Hong Kong every single day. And it's almost like this tidal wave of changes and events and laws um, that, that are happening so fast that it's almost impossible to keep track of what's happening. And I think one of the problems is we've seen this um, ebbing away of the media from Hong Kong. A lot of international news organizations are moving out of Hong Kong because of the national security legislation that was uh, imposed on Hong Kong in June 2020, um, which is very broad and very vague and makes it quite hard to operate in Hong Kong. So, you know, within the last week, we saw Amnesty International is leaving Hong Kong because of the national security legislation. 
And not only is it leaving, but it was criticized for leaving Hong Kong uh, by a lawmaker who said uh, it was smearing the national security legislation by saying that was a reason for leaving. So, you know, we saw that. We saw um, just in the last week, uh, the second uh, national security case, the verdict came out. Someone, a man called Ma Chun Man, received seven years in prison uh, for slogans and signs that were seen to be uh, having a clear intent to incite subversion. Um, but, you know, that case, these national security cases, the impact is so huge. What, you know, I think what they're talking about is basically word crimes because he had signs saying Hong Kong independence, the only way out, Hong Kong people establish our state, but there was no evidence of organization or anything else. It was simply the act of carrying the signs um, that, was uh, the reason for the sentence. But we're not seeing, as you point out, we're not seeing a lot of coverage of this in a way that I think we ought to be seeing. And I think one of the reasons is the the risks are quite high for, you know, the, the, the law is very vague, it's very broad. There are a lot of um, rules about court reporting that make it very hard. For, for journalists to deal with, unless you're sitting in, you know, those courtrooms, unless you're completely across what's allowed and what isn't, you know, the risks are very high. And we're seeing the Journalism Association, Hong Kong Journalists Association as well, is being targeted by the pro-Beijing media. So there are so many things that are happening all at once. It becomes really hard, I think, to talk about because some of such big things like the national security, um, the implementation in this way of the national security legislation, which has got massive uh, ramifications for free speech in Hong Kong. But then you've got really tiny things as well. So I think it was over the weekend, these runners in the Hong Kong Marathon, did you see this story? They were told to cover up their shorts or change their clothes because they had that slogan, uh, Ad Oil Hong Kong. Uh, Oh, which just, and this, just means, it just means go. It just, means, it just go. means go. It's actually what people cheer at sporting events for the team that they're backing. So uh, Jiayo, go China was something that people would say during the Olympics. And so simply to say, go Hong Kong is seen as a subversive um, statement. Yeah. But even in itself, that's quite tricky because in, I think it was in court, they had an expert who said that statement, go Hong Kong, can be deemed subversive or seditious, sorry, deemed seditious in certain contexts. So how are you able to judge which context it's deemed subversive in and which it isn't? But when you have people, you know, who are forced to change their clothes in a running race or thrown out of the running race because it, they're wearing these character, you know, these slogans, I, 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 it's a small thing, but I think it really speaks to the, the place that Hong Kong is, has now sort of got to where, you know, word, word crime is a thing. So if we, if we sort of cycle back two years ago, I was thinking about to give a sense of how much has changed that two years ago, um, this time of the year, there was a run up to a uh, district council election where there were candidates saying basically whatever they wanted in terms of stating their positions on a range of issues. And there was a free and open, it was the closest to Hong Kong's never had pure democracy, but for the district councils, these were competitive elections in which a wide variety of people were running and it was a, a sweep of uh, democratic um, candidates. And then you move forward from there to the national security law, which you talked about coming in in, in 2020, which initially just you know, to remind everybody was something that um, Carrie Lam and the other members of the Hong Kong government said would only affect a tiny minority of people who were doing really outrageous things. 
and that this was needed to, um, to keep something in line. But then what we've seen since then, and I think this is one of the things that makes it hard to cover, that it wasn't as though right after that went into effect, thousands of people were arrested under the new national security law. It wasn't as though every high profile dissident was immediately put behind bars or every high profile pro-democracy um, person. Instead, it was that there were very selective um, arrests, but what there was in its wake was um, group after group being targeted uh, by the government and by the police at intervals. So that at one point there were attacks, there were moves against um, journalists at another point, or there was a move against the highest profile uh, newspaper, Apple Daily. At another point, there were moves against uh, unions of one or another profession, and then at another uh, against another um, union. So from within, from within Hong Kong, the feeling that people have been expressing who are following this is that it's, it's relentless and it's fast and all kinds of things are disappearing very quickly. But from the outside, and I think this is the challenge, from the outside, it looks like things happen in one week's news cycle and then something else happens in the next news cycle. And so it's the cumulative effect that is so um, devastating compared to what things were two years ago where you had open elections, things that you had even um, one year ago where you hadn't yet had something like micromanaging policing what people could wear in a race. But the sum total effect is a feeling of the ground being pulled out from under people. But I would say it's not like, I don't think it, it happens in ways that they target journalists and then they move on to something else. I mean, I think it's blanket. <laughs> you know, everybody is being targeted at the same time continuously. Right, um, it, never, it never stops. After the one, <laughs> no group then gets back to not being monitored. It just keeps being, maybe it's the wrong metaphor, it's an expanding an expanding web that gradually seems like it's, it's covering all spaces for, for speech and expression and organization. And I mean, there have been 155 arrests under the national security law. So it, I mean, you said it's not as if everybody, thousands of people have been targeted, but I think, you know, there've been a hundred people charged, 155 arrests. If you look at who those people are, what you see is they are people who played a really important role in Hong Kong civil society, they're activists, organizers, and then of course, 47 democratic politicians who, who ran a, a primary to, decide who to nominate. So I think the people who have been targeted is, you know, that that in itself is extremely important um, because it, it is sending a message to the rest of society. Um, so I, you know, I guess I'd ask you, because your book is called Vigil, but it came out uh, last year, the year before, Came out early in 2020, yeah. Early in 2020, but the vigil just seems to sort of go on and on, doesn't it? So vigil, you know, when we came up with the the, the title of it, um, and actually it was the editor that came up with the title, who's a Hong Konger, Jimmy So, who came up with the, the title at Columbia uh, Global Reports, it was going to just be called Hong Kong on the Brink. And he said, is there something evocative that would draw attention to the themes in the book? and he suggested vigil and it, there was an obvious appeal because the ability to hold a vigil on June 4th every year to mark the anniversary of the uh, massacre in Beijing in 1989 was a key sign that Hong Kong was different. You could gather where you couldn't other places. But vigil also has a sense of watching over somebody who's badly injured or dying. And so I think the sense that keeping vigil for Hong Kong has been something now that's been going on for, um, for a couple of years. And the other meaning of it is that um, from, the, from the outside, one of the things that there was the expectation, would there be a massacre when there were large protests? 
Um, and there wasn't the kind of equivalent of um, tanks and shooting in the street. But there were individual, um, particularly young people who were either, um, who died in, in some cases, in one case, um, fell from a parking garage and was being, uh, that was being tear gassed. And um, what happened actually after this, there were also suicides where people left notes saying they were, they were, um, they were committing a political suicide because of the fate of the city. But what happened was that even small scale vigils for those individuals who were seen as martyrs um, to the movement were banned. And so it became not only, so the big story, getting back to your, the big story of the little story, the big story is that you can no longer hold um, a vigil on June 4th. There can no longer be over 100,000 people gathering in Victoria Park as happened uh, for years as a, as a big sign of Hong Kong's difference. When there's not that vigil, that will be still a headline story every year at June 4th, at least for now. But what's the smaller story that I think is telling is if somebody goes to leave flowers at the spot where that was associated with one person's death of say a political suicide, that will be blocked by the police. The police are trying to handle even, are trying to block even the smallest expressions of resistant or discontent. Um, so there's a way in which it's, I think thinking about the big stories and the small stories, um, as you said, is a, is a crucial way to do it. And even the numbers of arrests, I was thinking about it when you said how many people were arrested. What you have to think about is how many people left Hong Kong because they felt um, that, the, that the person who was being targeted was so similar to them that they would be next. You probably have an, you have an exponential number of people who have disappeared from civil society, have disappeared from the public sphere in Hong Kong, some into jail cells, and then a lot over borders because they felt that their, their number would be next. But I wanted, yeah. to, I wanted to ask you a question because we've both written at times about how even though there wasn't a massacre, many of the other things associated with Tiananmen, uh, the, what you called the Tiananmen playbook, have been used in repression. And so I thought if you could talk about that Tiananmen playbook, and you also wrote recently about there being a purge like what took place after Tiananmen. So I think that's a really powerful way of putting it. So could you talk about what you mean by this? Yeah. Um, so uh, Graham Smith and I wrote a piece for uh, the China Yearbook about that whole idea of a Tiananmen playbook, but actually we wrote it, um, you know, I think it was a year ago, more than, more than a year ago. And since then, you know, I, I think we've been proved not to be wrong, which, which is a little sad. <laughs> um, but uh, at the beginning, you know, the thing, even when the protests in Hong Kong started in 2019, the thing that really struck me was the language that, that was used, the official language. And if you cast your mind right back to June 2019, the decision to uh, label the protesters as rioters that it you know seemed so similar to the April 26th editorial in 1989 when the protesters in Beijing were were was you know it was deemed to be turmoil. So you know right from that moment I was kind of watching the language um, and you know noting how much of the discourse was mirroring the type of language used in 1989. You know, you'll remember the black hands behind the movement uh, in 1989, those were sort of democracy activists. You know, fast forward to 2019, it was people like uh, Joshua Wong and, you know, if uh, people who met, you know, young politicians or activists were, who met US consulate officials, you know, they were seen to be, uh, these external hostile foreign forces that were influencing events and all of that was you know it was almost sort of play by play a rerun of the same kind of reasoning um, that they used 
1989. And I, I mean, you must have been noting that at the time as well, right? Yeah, and I mean, so, and, and actually right after the movement. So, I mean, your book is um, such a powerful book on the amnesia that was imposed on, um, or the effort at, at blotting out memory of 1989. But right after the massacre in 1989, do you remember there was a constant talking about it actually by the government and trying to tell its story, painting the, the pro protesters as black hands, manipulated by foreign forces. There were instant histories published uh, showing the government's view of what had happened that so contradicted what the world had watched um, in the international media's coverage. And that was something else from the Tiananmen playbook that was true in Hong Kong. There were, there have been these kinds of concerted efforts by, um, by the Hong Kong authorities to tell its story of something in which these small numbers of people backed by foreign um, forces created this turmoil, all of the kind of terminology keeps being, um, kept being used that way. And- but Wasn't it interesting when you think about it, if you think back to 2019, do you remember at the time Twitter and social media was full of those short videos from uh, from state-run media, Chinese state-run media? Every time you know you, you would see these videos of Hong Kong protesters behaving in a really violent way, and I think that too was. Um, you know, always set to really kind of stirring music, so clouds of tear gas stirring music, and, and this real attempt to sh show a kind of, you know, cinematic visual view, uh, representation of Beijing's view, and in a way that I think was an update of the propaganda effort for the social media age. Um, and, you know, Twitter and Facebook and YouTube, they all kept taking down these accounts which uh, they would find had emanated from China. But then a lot of those kind of, that kind of content was being amplified by Chinese diplomats and was just circulating and circulating. So I think the, the tactics were the same, but the tools were a little bit different this time around. Yeah, and I mean, another thing that came up that I hadn't thought about until um, this was in 1989, a lot was made of the fact that there were a small number of soldiers who suffered violence from crowds. And that was um, shown on, on state television over and over again to try to get you to forget the violence that the vast proportion of the vast preponderance of the violence was the soldiers against uh, civilians. And similarly in Hong Kong, where there were, there was an enormous amount of police violence against um, unarmed protesters. As soon as there was any violence directed at police, that was shown over and over again as a way to try to, um, try to, to, to change the story. And it wasn't that these were completely invented incidents. It was just the proportionality that was so out of whack, which is often what happens uh, with social media, but even before social media would happen with state-run television. Um, you would take an isolated incident and try to make it seem like it was uh, the main, the main uh, story that was going on. This began even in the umbrella movement in 2014, where um, the Beijing, the mainland media was saying, these are, these are wild, uh, these are people creating chaos. But in fact, the protests were quite, um, were quite calm, at least initially. Uh, so the mainland was blocking Instagram because they didn't want images to come over to the mainland showing these very peaceful protests. But as soon as there was a single, um, as soon as there was a single outburst of, of uh, as soon as you could show an image of a crowd behaving in a rowdy fashion, then that would be shown on state television over and over again on the mainland. So yeah, you see a you see recurring patterns in this kind of effort to, um, to sell the story. And I mean, I think those patterns were also being um, reflected. For example, here in Melbourne, uh, in the June the 4th 
vigil on in 2020, it, they, you know, they often rig up, uh, you know, so you're watching footage. So we they interspersed footage from 1989 in Beijing with footage from 2019 in Hong Kong. And so, you know, the meaning of the June the 4th vigil globally, I think, it, it has shifted over those over that period because you know the crackdown that happened in Hong Kong it did not happen in the same way but that there, there were again elements of similarity you know um it, it wasn't in Hong Kong it wasn't tanks it was uh uh riot police but actually that echoes what happened in Chengdu in 1989. They didn't send in the army, they didn't send in the PLA there, it was a uh, paramilitary armed police. And in Chengdu in 1989, there was a lot of beating of people by paramilitary armed police with, with batons, um, which is also something that, that we saw in Hong Kong, a lot of sort of actual sort of brute force used against protesters. So, you know, in some of the tactics, there's a similarity, but then I think what we're seeing now, that purge, the post-movement purge, that again is aping the same methods. And, um, you know, I, I um, did a, had a conversation with Jeremy Brown, who's just written a book about uh, 1989 as well. And he characterizes the post-movement purge as, you know, a purge that started in 1989 and continues to this day. And I think what we see in Hong Kong now is, you know, it's that purge kind of being rolled out in Hong Kong in the same way. Um, and there's a section in his book, which I think is really interesting, where he has found documents um, from work units in Beijing showing how people were forced to apologize or write self-criticisms in 1989 to say they weren't involved or they didn't really know what they were doing or you know someone else made them do it and how people kind of went through the motions and one of the arguments that he posits is that this was not because people believed what they were saying it was just making people go through the motions to bow down to the post massacre reality to abase themselves and show that they accepted this sort of political reality. And, you know, when I look at what is happening in Hong Kong, you know, when I look at, you know, the, it reminds me so much of that, particularly, you know, what we saw over the last couple of months, the whole saga about the pillar of shame, the Tiananmen Memorial in Hong Kong University, where the university is actually asking the sculptor to remove it, um, you know, and really said, you know, universities in Hong Kong have always prided themselves on their ability to be a place where ideas can be discussed, no, one, no matter what the stripe, you know, they all, every single one has had a democracy war uh, where anything can be placed on them. And now we're seeing those democracy walls are often, you know, they're empty, they're covered up. Sometimes they have uh, banners in front of, not banners, you know, barriers in front of them to stop access so that no one can get close. And, you know, I, I, I feel all of that it is, you know, to me, it has such uh, echoes of, of that purge. I mean, what, what do you think when you see, how do you sort of connect the two periods? No, I think, I think there's, there, for me, I, I connect them in, in, in lots of ways, both because, so I was in China, I wasn't there in 89, but I was there in 86. And there was this idea of open-endedness of not knowing where there were starting to be protests and what, what would the direction be that would go. And then there was a massive protest a few years later, uh, there was sort of a warm-up protest to 1989 and 86 in ways that now the umbrella movement seems like a warm-up protest to the big struggle of 2019. So there's this eerie kind of parallel between those, those kinds of things. And 
86 on um, Shanghai campuses, you would see posters put up with all kinds of political positions being spelled out. And then the government said, no, oh, you're just creating chaos. But then students a few years later put up, put up an even bigger struggle. So it's not all just a student movement, but I think in the thinking about the campuses, I think there's something, um, for me, it was Hong Kong in the 2010s felt a lot like what mainland campuses had felt like in the mid 1980s in the lead up to, to, to 1989. And then to have things like democracy walls disappear is like, again, the idea of universities being a space for open debate disappearing again in very much the same way. So all in all, I think there are just many ways that the things that in the 2010s, I felt like, oh, here's something we no longer see on the mainland, but we still see in Hong Kong. And but I would push back can... against that. I, I, I think I'll push back against that because I, I think what happened in the universities in, in China in the 1980s was they went from being unfree to being freer. Whilst Hong Kong universities have been free. They, it's not like they were free, they were less free before the 2010s. And I think that's, that's quite a significant difference. It's a big difference, but I think they were less political. I mean, in the, in the 80s, when I was in Hong Kong universities, they were free spaces, but they weren't terribly politicized spaces. They weren't, there weren't democracy walls that were uh, crucial, but you're right. It's a big difference to go from, um, from being steadily places for free discussion to being closed down. Yeah, there was a headiness in the 80s and in China for people feeling like, oh, we can start talking about things that we that we couldn't talk about um, before. So that that is that is definitely um, that's definitely a good point. But I, I wanted to um, ask you, actually, as a historian, to go back further in time and you know. I think one comparison that people have made that I find really interesting is comparing Hong Kong's basic law with the 17 point agreement that uh, was struck by the Dalai Lama in 1951, um, which the Chinese signed and then ignored completely. I mean, how, do you, how, how, how close do you think that parallel is? So I think the situation in Tibet is really a powerful one to think about. That so if we if we think about it, in in you know in 1949 the Chinese Communist Party comes to power, and it's not over. It's not in control of the whole country immediately, and it tries to make it makes a set of promises to groups of different people. Um, Tibet, the 17 point agreement is a great example of saying, look, you'll be part of the country but you'll have a great deal of ability to go your own way and to keep your own traditions and, and, um, and what you value. And so this deal is made in 1951. And actually, for a while, even though there are some people who, who feel that it's in bad will from the start, to a certain extent, it seems to be working for a little bit in the 1950s. But then the center becomes greedy at trying to limit the control there people push back, things reach a boiling point. And then in 1959, there's more upheaval and then there's a clampdown. So you actually see in that eight year period, a kind of parallel to then what happens from 1997, when Hong Kong is promised to have this one country, two systems arrangement to um, the national security law where there stops being that space at all. So you, you have a kind of similar pattern where it's the, it's the Communist Party saying, we will only, we'll only inter we'll, we'll, we'll have a light touch. A little while it seems like maybe they will have a light touch and then the grip gets tighter and tighter, resistance inevitably um, pushes back and then there just becomes a sense in which there's only uh, the only option is um, is the center calling the shot. So in Hong Kong, it became one country, two systems. Um, what local people thought the two systems meant was a great deal of um, of true autonomy to um, to have a different kind of civil society, to have a different kind of 
economy, to have a different kind of uh, lifestyle, to have a different language used. And gradually the center starts saying, no, 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 really what we meant was a different kind of economy, a different way of making and spending money, uh, which is what there is in Macau, say, um, but not this difference in, in other realms. And so you have a replay with differences in the way it plays out, but something similar to what happened in Tibet, and not just Tibet. There were promises made when Shanghai was absorbed, uh, this very international um, consumerist uh, city was absorbed into a uh, Communist Party run state. There were um, factory owners and others who thought, oh, maybe we, and journalists who said, maybe we can actually continue very much the way we did before because Beijing is saying, we're going to give you a lot of space, but gradually the space starts disappearing and disappearing. And I think it was largely the feeling that that was what was happening in Hong Kong that led to the determination of the resistance in 2019, this sense of being inexorably pulled into this homogenizing pattern. And under Xi Jinping, there's a particularly um, strong emphasis put on blotting out all kinds of, uh, as many forms of difference as possible. So I do see, it's never an exact replica, repli uh, replay, but there are some parallels, definitely. I mean, in 2019, the triggering factor was the extradition law that they tried to pass, uh, they tried to impose. Um, and, you know, without that, would, would it have been the same? I, well, so, so I think of the extradition law as a perfect example of the one country, two systems. Uh, the, the idea that it isn't really going to be two systems, because one of the key parts of the two systems for the minds of many people in Hong Kong was a very different rule of law structure, rule of law rather than rule by law on the mainland. So that was one of the, you know, of course, that was one of the specific triggers. But we had all sorts of signs even before that that, I mean, one of the other differences of what made it a two systems was that you could publish completely different kinds of books in Hong Kong than you could on the mainland. But of course, you know, the disappearing booksellers, um, the, the essentially kidnapping and spiriting across the border of people who are publishing books that the mainland authorities didn't want to have published there. This happened late 2015, early 2016. That was an assault on that when there were some elected legislators in this never fully democratic uh, legislature, but one that had space for open debate when some of the people who were elected were disqualified for not taking their oaths in a, um, showing enough fealty in the way they took their oaths. This was another sign. All of these things between 2014 and 2019, there were just a lot of signs that, um, the idea of a robust two systems was not going to be allowed there. So as a historian, how do you now view, I mean, what we have seen, and you talked about that exodus of Hong Kongers and particularly to the UK where we've seen, you know, tens of thousands of Hong Kongers taking up residence in the UK. As a historian, how do you view those Hong Kongers in exile, sort of in the historical context of anti-colonial movements and the sort of role played by Sun Yat-sen? Is, is, are the parallels there that we can sort of be looking at? I think, I think it's good to think about parallels from, you know, there, when there have been stifled movements for change um, in different parts of, of China, there have been, um, movements have been carried on by exiles in different places. In the late Qing, when an effort at reform was, was blocked, then you had um, people going to places like Tokyo to set, up, um, to set up new journals, to spread new ideas. Uh, Sun Yat-sen uh, raising money in the United States and other places to try to keep alive a movement for change that couldn't continue on the mainland. So I think that's that's certainly one of the parallels, but the other parallel is a broader one that um, really what we're seeing in Hong Kong is it's becoming, um, the it's very much like an anti-colonial movement and anti-colonial movements in many times and places 
have been kept alive by, by people outside of the territory in question, whether it's you know, from the, the, the Philippine independence movement, other kinds of um, anti-colonial movements, it's often, um, it's often kept alive by exiles who join up. One of the interesting things that's kind of different right now about um, the Hong Kong exiles is they're forming alliances, we'll see how this goes, of people who have similar kinds of grievances. Certainly there are some efforts to link up with exiles from um, Tibet and from Xinjiang, but there are also moves for solidarity with, um, with Thai activists and with Myanmar activists, what's being called the Milk Tea Alliance, um, this idea of people who share, who have very different, come out of very different movements, but share a kind of concern, deep concern with the fate of, um, of their political communities and see um, common grievances and possibilities to work together. But even that has historical parallels because there were alliances of anti-colonial activists who were in exile from Ireland or India and, um, and Southeast Asia joining about a hundred years ago into these kinds of rough leagues. And so at least there's, there, there are parallels there. But I guess one of the things that um, Beijing has done quite effectively is to marginalize exiled groups. And I mean, we saw that particularly with the Tiananmen generation. And granted, they're a very different kind of cohort to the Hong Kong ex exiles. You know, people from Hong Kong tend to be very well educated, very globalized, very um, you know, fluent in English, very articulate, very well informed. And um, the Tiananmen exiles would not, didn't really have any of those advantages. But do you think, how do you see the possibility of those Hong Kong groups changing, uh, moving that dial? So I'll turn it back to you. What do you what do you see that as a possibility? I mean, I guess we we could think about two sort of models for this out of looking back to history. There is there's been the Tibetan exile community, which sort of set up things like um, an alternative government in exile. And there have been some moves like that within Hong Kong community. Perhaps it's it's that the rallying point for Hong Kong exiles is a specific um, you know, valued community, a set of symbols, a language that is actually different from, um, from the group they're challenging. Whereas maybe, maybe that's why the thinking of the Hong Kong exiles more like an anti-colonial group, which the Tiananmen exiles weren't. But is your sense so far that there does seem to be um, the potential for the Hong Kong exiles to be a different kind of force? I find it, I, I'm not sure yet. Uh, I think it's quite early days because, you know, people are leaving all the time. And, you know, when you leave somewhere, there's, you know, there's so much that you have to do before you can begin mobilizing. I do know that the, their exiles have been quite strategic, including deciding which people should move to which countries. I think there's been a really interesting, um, focus, I mean, you know, here in Australia, the, the sort of focus on lobbying for changes in particular laws in Australia and things like that, lobbying particular parts of you know, government and parliament and stuff like that, which is a lot more strategic than um, what we might have seen in, in 1989. But what the impact will be is another question at this point in time. Yeah, I mean, I think I think it's important to keep some sort of basis for hope. And I guess there are some of these groups that um, in history have found ways to keep a movement alive, even in these seemingly impossible um, situations. But um, but there are also challenges to it. Um, 
Well, thank you for getting this really stimulating conversation started. Uh, I'd like to remind our audience members that if you have a Q&A for Jeff and Louisa, um, if you have a question for, for uh, Jeff and Louisa, you can please put your question in the Q&A box at the, the bottom of the screen and I'll just collect those questions and ask them on your behalf. Um, I think maybe to just kick this off, I wanted to ask a, perhaps a self-interested question. Um, a lot of the discussion thus far has kind of focused on media and journalism um, and groups like Amnesty International. Um, but I'm curious, uh, as two academics, what you think the future of academic historical writing on Hong Kong will look like. Um, a lot of historians have traditionally gone to Hong Kong to research topics coming out of the PRC. Um, and so I, I'm wondering what the prospects are for historians and other academic researchers going to Hong Kong to, to research controversial topics either within Hong Kong itself uh, or within mainland China. Will the two of you be returning to Hong Kong at any point in the near future? I would say I think the prospects for at this point in time, um, it, it's really a mixed picture. If you look, you know, as you say, Hong Kong has been such an important place for research on China, but I think that those windows are closing down, you know, the services center, the Chinese University of Hong Kong that has been so important for so many generations of academics is being restructured in a way that I think is quite alarming, people find quite alarming. Um, and if you talk to academics inside Hong Kong, there's a great deal of anxiety and fear because of the national security legislation. I think we are seeing a growth in Hong Kong studies outside Hong Kong with, you know, much more focus being, you know, the Hong Kong studies centers being set up in universities, which is great, but I think, the the um you know again the fact that the national security legislation is extraterritorial that it can be applied globally it does very much aimed at having a chilling impact on any kind of discussion of hong kong out anywhere in the world um and i think that is something that you know if you're doing research on hong kong you really need to think about you know it does mean that any conversation about Hong Kong, you know, you need to have a level of thought about, you know, how, how you discuss these issues. Um, and I think it makes, you know, it does complicate the study of, of Hong Kong overseas. Um, just the very fact of, of its um, existence. And, I, you know, the other thing that we are seeing, it's not about academia, but we are seeing that creeping influence. You know, even here in Australia, the, there's been a scandal over the past couple of days with an arts festival, the Oz Asia Festival, where a Hong Kong arts group had wanted to um, have a stall and they had wanted to put yellow umbrellas on their stall as part of their performance. And they were told in Australia that they were not allowed to do it because it was a political act. Um, and so, you know, I think we are seeing the sort of creeping impact of the national security legislation um, in a way that I think does make a study of Hong Kong, um, you know, it, it, puts a level of risk on it that had not existed in the past. I mean, what do you think, Jeff? So I was just gonna say that it's a sign of this that we should tell people that when you're asking questions, you have the right, you, you should feel free to ask them anonymously if you don't wanna have your name associated with a question. The fact that this is something you would legitimately worry about is a sign of the, how the national security law um, goes. And I, I was thinking about this um, because we've talked a lot about Tiananmen, that when I was writing about Tiananmen when I was uh, in the immediate wake of 1989, nobody suggested that doing that had any kind of danger. The only thing that maybe, and initially people weren't even saying uh, about, about visa issues, but even later they said the risk you took as a scholar working on this might be um, getting access 
to to a visa, it was never an idea of danger. It was never an idea of um, of the law reaching out to you. Um, I do think it's it's quite exciting what's happening in um, Hong Kong studies. Um, the University of California has just begun a global Hong Kong studies initiative that's exciting. That is, um, it's talking about Hong Kong culture, talking about Hong Kong um, history as well as Hong Kong politics, and that's just something that, um, I mean, ironically, when Hong Kong has become such a more threatened place, the idea of it being central to discussions uh, within it, the academy is striking. There are initiatives for, um, you know, for, for postdocs and, and different kinds of things for Hong Kong studies that just didn't exist before. Before it was like, if you're studying Hong Kong, it's not really China. It's, it's such a fringe part of China that it isn't somehow um, interesting or important. So it's significant at the same time it's becoming dangerous, which maybe again is something that we saw somewhat with the worst things have gotten in Xinjiang with the horrors there. The, there's been a kind of flourishing of really excellent writing on Xinjiang uh, because of this kind of sense of the importance to understand it, even though it's becoming virtually impossible to do the kind of next generation of research. You have a short-term flourishing, but then what will happen longer if people are cut off from, from going there? And there might also be an issue with sources of information of archives in Hong Kong being shut down. You know, we're already seeing books disappearing off life, library shelves in Hong Kong. I mean, at the moment that's only, books by activists and politicians, people deemed sensitive. But the moment that starts, you know, I think it's often accompanied by, you know, actually there has been a problem of access to Hong Kong archives, certain archives for quite a while, um, whereby some of the archives were removed to England and then closed off. So there was not access to them anyway. Um, I don't know if access to archives within Hong Kong is also going to start becoming more difficult. That might be something to watch. Yeah, it certainly determines what types of topics are feasible um, when a lot of these types of archives like the University Services Center are being shut down and, and academics have to really kind of police the types of things that they say. Um, so turning to another type of media, we got a question from an audience member who wants to hear your thoughts on Hong Kong's new film censorship law, which was just passed yesterday. Um, and in particular, she's interested in this wording of the film censorship law, which she characterizes as weirdly imprecise. Um, and so the law says, the law empowers Hong Kong's chief secretary to revoke a film's license if it is found to be contrary to national security interests. So what do you think that vague wording is designed to either capture or exclude? Uh, I see the question from Shelley. Thank you, Shelley, for your question. I think it's it's so alarming because we keep seeing the laws on film censorship being tightened and tightened and tightened again. Um, and the risk, uh, I mean, the punishment seems very high. It's three years in jail or a $1 million fine for showing films that are deemed to be against national security, but also a ban on films, you know, this legislation allows them to stop films that have previously been permitted from being shown. Um, I, I think it, you know, the that weirdly imprecise wording is designed that way in the same way that the national security legislation is weirdly imprecise because then it can expand and contract in the interests of whoever is it is implementing the legislation i mean i guess one you know actually the role of filmmakers in 
depicting the events of 2019 to a global audience, I think has been really intense. I think um, there are a lot of films that have been made. There are a lot of films that are coming out and they're, you know, some of them are amazing films. And I guess uh, it's complete speculation, but I guess the authorities began looking at these films and panicking because of course, the power of um, the visual image is so is so strong. Um, so I, I, you know, I, I, I guess the, you know, you you can look at these kind of um, this kind of legislation is really um, showing the power of art. Uh, when other forms of media, when other controls um, are being imposed, you know, the power of art to move is such that, you know, they keep the, the, the this seems to be this necessity to keep tightening it up. I don't know, Jeff, what do you think? No, I was gonna say, you, you, you don't wanna talk specifically about your book, but your book will have art uh, as part of it. You've written very powerfully about uh, visual media in the past. So I think that's definitely true. Just at a personal level, I talked about the things that I used to know, like, oh, I'm in Hong Kong, I'm not on the mainland because of X. One of the things for me was always that the film Gate of Heavenly Peace, this very powerful movie about 1989, was something that was banned across the mainland, but it was viewable in Hong Kong. And that was one of the markers. And so I think, you know, all the ways that the, the two systems part is disappearing. Um, I think the that that film was something. It's been so powerful. It's been such a part of what the Hong Kong identity would be, and it's actually been. And this is one case where I think, in some ways, Beijing has really shot itself in the foot. If one thing it cares about is soft power, about having creations come out of the People's Republic of China that people globally admire and want to emulate, Hong Kong film was one of the the great success stories. Um, so were Hong Kong universities for a while uh, until the global university ranking system started saying that uh, mainland universities, which did not have um, free debate, but had um, good labs and had people publishing in peer review journals could be rising up in the ranks and rather than saying that Hong Kong universities uh, stood apart. But I think all of these, these are part of a piece. Um, I did see a, a political cartoon just came out about the um, film laws where an actor comes in and says, oh, this is great, I've learned all my lines. And the question is, oh, have you learned all the red lines? These are the shifting lines of what can and can't um, be said. But it was great to get that question um, from, from Shelley, who has been doing a lot to try to spread the word of the good films that Hong Kong are making. So to have somebody who you're following to keep up on a subject, ask you a question about a subject is one of the kind of um, cool things about these uh, global events. Yeah, is, is there any, I, I'm curious to know what Shelley himself thinks. I don't know if we have any way of <laughs> communicating, <laughs> of bringing him into the discussion. Uh, possibly if Shelley wants to type into the Q and A box, I can I can read. Um, but in the interim, there's sort of a related question to the the question about film policies, and this is just uh, asking about art and literature more broadly in Hong Kong. Um, so this audience member is curious uh, about your thoughts on the contemporary Hong Kong art world. Um, and uh, he writes, you know, my sense is that the art world. Um, uh, people who were previously active have suddenly become silent or they've decided to leave Hong Kong. So could you talk a little bit about the impact of the national security law on art and literary production? I mean, I think we see the impact. If you look at the whole saga of M plus the new art museum, which for so many years has, they've invested so much money in, in this sort of gigantic cavernous extremely expensive museum and now it's about to open and you know what are the headlines about the headlines are about the fact that Ai Weiwei's art can no longer be shown and you know Ai Weiwei's you know his um his 
pictures the I think it's the fuck off series where he's raising his finger towards various monuments in China is you know because of the national security legislation that can't be shown um so the museum itself it starts to look you know in its own way like a, a memorial for things that can no longer be be shown or seen I mean I don't know that artists have been silent I think artists have shifted the way they operate and I think there's been a, a flourishing of some amazing art in Hong Kong uh, it may not be so high profile but um, there have been sort of these extraordinary exhibitions. There's one artist whose name I've forgotten who did a whole series of pictures where uh, they were pictures of the protests, but every single face of the crowd. So you had these pictures of crowds, you know, that it's a million people protest, but every single face was clipped out. So there were all these holes, so you couldn't see the people. I mean, that in itself is, a, is an extraordinary statement. Um, and the other artist I'm thinking of whose work, I mean, I think a lot of artists have been doing work that has directly been talking or discussing the protests in, in their own way. I'm also thinking of Giraffe Learn, who was um, using tape to frame the scars of the protests, the slogans that were um, that were bolded out and calling it untitled. I think he, um, I think those have been sort of direct comments on what has happened. But I think as the law's uh, implementation has sort of spread, I think what we see are artists shifting their focus into things that can be done. And, and one of the things that can be done is, is memorializing. <clears throat> remembering, marking Hong Kong. And I think, so I think we're seeing quite a lot more of that kind of response. I, I don't think it necessarily means that they're silent. I just think, uh, you know, artists have to find a way to operate within the constraints that are available. And um, that has been one response. Yeah, I would say that, I mean, you know, this would a whole nother place to look for kind of historical parallels or parallels. And these are things that people in Hong Kong are, are thinking and talking about as well, are settings such as like in the Soviet bloc after moments like Prague Spring and the crushing of it. And um, the way in which people keep a spirit of resistance alive in small ways, maybe in um, different kinds of artistic expression. And this was true also in um, Taiwan during the long period of martial law. You don't have a, I mean, there was actually quite extraordinary um, literary production uh, in retrospect in places like um, Czechoslovakia after Prague Spring. Um, in we're now getting more aware of it in Taiwan under martial law, but it would often have to take subtler forms in the same way that resistance has to take um, subtler forms, more indirect, subtle forms of satire. We're gonna see those kinds of things. Film, I think, is one of the things that gets in the crossfire much stronger because it takes money, it takes uh, collective action, it takes, it takes a showing, it takes public things. Whereas the way that people are keeping things alive are gonna be more likely to be in smaller forms of art. And I think what Louisa said, it's, it's also about memorializing Hong Kong or paying attention to the special nature of the place does become itself a political act and an artistic act. And we're also, this is another place where the, the art will be kept alive in exile communities, but the reach of the national security law, I mean, I know of very talented artists who are having to try to figure out whether they sign the art they do or, or publish it anonymously. When people are writing creatively, do they write under their own name or under a pen name? These are, these are not new phenomena, but I think they're new phenomena for Hong Kong because one of the differences was you didn't have to be that careful. Um, so we have still have a couple of, of questions and um, 
this next question kind of takes us outside of the literary and artistic world and is more trying to, I guess, get into the brain of the Chinese Communist Party. Uh, but this audience member is curious about why China would pursue these types of policies, not just concerning um, the suppression of dissent in Hong Kong, but also policies in places like Xinjiang um, that are very alienating to the rest of the international community. Um, you know, why is China doing this? Does China have the leverage to get away with these things? Um, are they not fearing reprisals from the international community or maybe the international community hasn't offered a big enough stick uh, to hit China with? So um, can you speak a little bit to that? So I think, I think um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a variety of uh, reasons. Um, some of the some of the crackdown on Hong Kong has been done because global distraction makes it easier to do this. The declining um, the declining admiration for competing systems makes it um, create space uh, for the Chinese Communist Party to do some of these um, behaviors and um, Xinjiang as well. We need to think of a, a kind of globally connected world. I mean, Sean Roberts recent book, The War on the Uyghurs, makes a strong case for the way in which the discourse of the war on terror um, after 9-11 helped create some of the, um, the rhetoric that, the, that Beijing could then use for moving against Uyghurs. So these are, these are interconnected. Um, we also have a particular leader in charge in, um, in Beijing who is um, more devoted or seems more devoted to this kind of homogenizing of, of the country under, under, under his rule. But the fact of, um, to some extent, I could say at the other hand, it, the, the cost that the Chinese Communist Party has paid for some of its moves in terms of the international community have not been um, as big as they might have been. Um, I alluded to the fact that say the clamping down on intellectual life on universities, the global response to that has been for the campuses where the purging of critical intellectuals have been taking places keep rising in the Times Higher Education Supplement um, annual rankings. So I'm not sure, I think the, the global, the world's forum has a lot to um, answer for this. Um, I quoted in uh, Vigil, Margaret Thatcher saying in 1990 that she was nervous about the deal that was gonna be made with Hong Kong, but she thought that um, Beijing would keep its promises because it would want to be seen by the forum of the world as, being, uh, as having kept its promises. But I think the forum of the world is a much more fragile and divided uh, entity now than it was was then. I mean, we are the Olympics are still going to presumably take place um, in Beijing without an enormous amount of outcry, despite um, all the attention to the camps in Xinjiang and other kinds of issues. So another way to put it would be, why hasn't the global outrage been stronger and more consistent uh, when a series of events have been happening that are truly, truly alarming? Yeah, and I would, I would add, I guess, why, why does China pursue these policies? The simple answer is because national, it is a national security state now. National security trumps everything else, including economics to a certain extent, I think. Um, or it's also the case that Chinese companies are so implicated into the global economy that actually uh you know the financial cost to china it, it, you know it, it those kind of rolling back that we kept hearing about this idea of decoupling is actually almost impossible um and so i think beijing perceives there to be a lower risk to itself or or that you know simply the dictates of national security are much more important than anything else. And if there is a price to pay, then so be it. 
But if we look at the kind of actions that have been taken against China, as you said, um, Jeff, that have not been such great consequences. You know, there've been a handful of senior um, officials have been uh, sanctioned in Beijing. Some Hong Kong officials have been sanctioned, including Carrie Lam, who complained that um, she had to be paid in cash because she couldn't have a bank account anymore because of it. But it hasn't, you know, I think the costs have been limited so far. Um, so, uh, you know, there was always, pre-97 in Hong Kong, there was always this idea that Hong Kong was the golden goose, that Hong Kong would be safe because the role that it played in China's economy was such that would protect it. But I think now we're in a very different reality. Hong Kong is, is no longer that kind of gateway to China's economy because you can directly invest in China itself. Hong Kong is no longer that necessary. It's, you know, so I think, you know, what we're seeing quite clearly is that that sort of golden goose rule, I think, is no longer a factor as much, uh, you know, or, you know, I think businesses, international businesses within Hong Kong are now looking at rule by law, the applications of the law, wondering if they want to stay. And I think uh, if they leave, I don't think that Beijing is that concerned at this stage. Um, well, it's certainly a, <laughs> a depressing situation for, for, I think, a lot of us who are invested in, in, in China and, and invested in, in its future. Um, maybe we can take one more question before wrapping up. Um, so this is a question from someone who um, formerly taught high school history in Hong Kong. And um, she is curious about the effectiveness of national identity education in Hong Kong. Um, so maybe you could just speak broadly about what national identity education consists of and whether you think it's, it's being effective. So I think it's, I mean, one of the things that um, is really striking with 2021 being such a, um, a dark year for Hong Kong, including the introduction of patriotic education, is exactly a decade after the first moves to try to bring in um, um, patriotic education. Um, which were what spurred the protests that led people like Joshua Wong and Agnes Chow into politics in the first place, were in 2011 when there were ideas floated to try to make civics education in Hong Kong more like what was on the mainland. And that was when I think an early harbinger of an idea that this two systems part was not understood by Beijing and Beijing's representatives in Hong Kong the way that a lot of local people wanted it um, to be understood. That there was a pride in, I think, um, the idea that if you were educated in Hong Kong, you could learn about, and Tiananmen was a clear example of this. In Hong Kong, you could learn about Tiananmen, you could learn about things about the world, you could learn about the blemishes in the history of China that you couldn't learn about just over the border. And so when there was the move to try to do away with that in 2011, there then became um, the protests. And in 2012, I think it's important to remember the government backed down um, those early protests by scholarism and the other, um, the group that uh, Joshua Wong and Agnes Chow were um, key figures in, the government tabled this idea of, um, of patriotic education. And then we see 10 years later as a kind of symbol of how much things have changed, um, this kind of being, being brought in. Um, and it is, fits with a piece with all kinds of things that are being done um, across the PRC to try to impose, to try to emphasize um, the way in which history is taught, that, that a single view of the past is imposed, um, how much impact it will have, or just whether this kind of thing creates um, resistance. I think we have in colonial settings, 
there often is a resistance to it when it's imposed too crudely. And I think at the moment it's being imposed um, very crudely there. So I think there will be limits, but you have, it's just another, it's another of the realms where you have um, a lot of tightening of screws. We have teachers now viewing the profession of teaching as being a dangerous thing in Hong Kong in a way that they didn't before. And you have the, the talk of, of a kind of brain drain from Hong Kong as people who were doing the, in professions like teaching are leaving because suddenly it's not just that you can do your own business without caring that much about politics. Everything is being um, politicized through this uh, patriotic education. Louisa, do you have anything to add or shall we? Um, I, I, I do think, the, I mean, I think the national education, national identity education in Hong Kong is um, the way in which it's being rolled out. It, you know, it, I think it's happening quite fast now. In just in the last few weeks, I've been seeing reports that schools are going to have, even international schools, going to have to have flag raising ceremonies uh, and all of this. Um, one of my big concerns looking forward is for the future of Hong Kong studies and for those scholars within Hong Kong who have been real pioneers of Hong Kong studies and have really carved out that sphere and study um, Hong Kong identity itself, how they will be able to operate under the new constraints. And you know that's one thing that I find deeply disturbing and worrying because we are beginning to see that purge of universities coming down to individual scholars certain people are being you know not having their contracts renewed or being laid off and it's often people whose sphere of focus is on Hong Kong itself or you know or with, with a kind of political lens and you know so that that to me is really alarming um and you know I, it's great that the hong kong studies centers opening overseas but I, I i just you know i i fear for how uh you know even how this issue of identity and hong kong identity can be discussed in the future inside hong kong um with, with the, the uh national security legislation be, being that the way that it is. Yeah, it's a, it's a, so many things are just, you know, tragic and ironic. It used to be, you would go to Hong Kong to be able to study the mainland. And now it's like, you have to go to Taiwan or outside of Hong Kong to study Hong Kong. Um, I mean, it's not completely that way, but that's, that's where the, the direction seems to be moving and endangering it. Well, on that optimistic note, <laughs> um, I would I'd like to thank Jeff Wasserstrom and Louisa Lim for this really stimulating conversation. Um, and on behalf of UCI's Humanities Center, I'd like to thank all of you for attending the first event in this new series, Ideas with Impact. Uh, the next event in the series will be on December 9th. It will be on the topic of class and capitalism. And it will feature Catherine Liu, a professor of film and media studies, and George Hoare and Alex Huchuli, who are activists and hosts of the Bunga podcast. So hopefully we will see you again um, at that next event. And until then, uh, have a good evening or a good morning, wherever you are, and uh, take care. <laughs>